little different than singing. You know, it's it's uh, sometimes it's all your. I imagine I've never I played the recorder, <laughs> but uh, uh, when you really gotta put the air through the through the instrument, um, twice might be too much to ask. That that was a great that was a great blessing. I'm so. I'm so uh, I'm, I'm blessed. I mean, it was it was perfection, and it was a song of the Lord uh, played to perfection and excellence, and that was a blessing. Thank you so much, Father. Tonight, open our eyes, teach us things, make us stronger, strengthen our faith. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. The word doctrine is universally defined as, and this is in quotes. What is taught? What is taught? Every effective teacher or leader or businessman or coach has a set of principles and philosophies for which he is known. Now, sometimes they're just teaching what somebody else taught them, but you read the great businessmen, the great coaches. In fact, there's so many books out there written by businessmen. There's books out there written by coaches, uh, managers, uh, teachers, leaders. I've got a ton. I don't know how many I've got on my bookshelf, but they're not just telling their story. They're writing their philosophy of leadership. Well, you know what their philosophy of leadership is? It's their doctrine. It's what they teach. Somewhere, I have an excellent book that I recommend if you want to learn leadership. It's called The West Point Way of Leadership. And it is just so, so profound in teaching how to lead. One of my favorite sports leaders is John Wooden. And John Wooden had a specific philosophy of coaching, and it's in his books. He's written books, and books have been been, uh, written about him. Uh, He was known as a disciplinarian, but he was compassionate. He was kind. His players loved him, but he didn't put up with any nonsense. And I shouldn't go down this road, but I'm in the neighborhood. Uh, He had a player, many of you, if if you're my age, you know the name Bill Walton. And uh, Bill Walton played for John Wooden. Well, this is the 60s, the 70s, and John uh, Bill Walton was totally in on the, uh, you know, the hippie scene, the whatever scene. And um, so John Walton had some rules about how to dress and how to, you know, how to conduct yourself. Well, Bill Walton just decided he was going to break those rules. He didn't care. And so he went up to Coach Wooden, and everybody respected Coach Wooden. Everybody followed his rules, but Bill Walton went up to him and just announced to him, I've just decided that we're, that I'm going to do what I want to do. See, he thought he was such a big star that John Wooden couldn't, wouldn't play without him. And so he said, uh, he said I just, I'm going to do what I want to do, and I want you to know I'm going I'm to go out and party at night, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dress this way even though it – contradicts your rules and I'm going to do this and I just want you to know that I'm going to do these things what do you think and coach Wooden in his very mild-mannered way said uh he said I I I I support your right to do that and he said really he said yeah he said we're gonna miss you Bill you would have been real good on our team but and and uh it changed it changed Bill Walton's I mean he he always was sort of a uh I hate to say punk, but um, but it did change his perspective and made him realize if you're going to play for a great coach, you got to follow the coach's rules. So that John Wooden had his own doctrine. You anybody, any leader uh, that that makes a difference has a set of teachings. That's what doctrine is. You know the name or the word indoctrinated. What does that mean? It means that somebody who believes something is passing that on to someone else. Sometimes indoctrinated, maybe more often than not, it's used in a negative connotation. But what it, what it shows us about the word doctrine is that when you're trying to communicate a set of truths, a body of ideas, that body of ideas is your doctrine. Christian doctrine, 
simply stated, is the body of teachings which comprise the Christian faith. Christian doctrine is Bible doctrine, and Bible doctrine is God's doctrine. And these terms can accurately be used interchangeably. So, Bible doctrine, Christian doctrine, God's doctrine, whatever you want to say, we're all talking, we're talking about the same things. There may be differences, there may be distinctions in, in the, the words, but there's no different in the body of truth. Christian doctrine is defined by God in his word, the Bible. Thus, the Bible is the source, the basis of all Christian doctrine. Now, that in itself is a part of Christian doctrine, and some people want to include in their doctrine some vision they saw, some word of knowledge they received. According to the Bible, that has no place in Christian doctrine. Christian doctrine is based on, Totally on the Bible. Now, let's talk about this story that we read for a moment. So Paul goes to this place, and, and he goes to this island. The island is Cyprus. They go all through the island. They come to the end of the island, and a certain ruler named Sergius Paulus hears about Paul and Barnabas, and he says, have those guys come, and I want to hear what they have to say. And he was doing so. Hmm. Oh, what's going on here? We're being invaded. Um, but uh, he was a sincere man. He sincerely wanted to hear Paul and Barnabas' message. And they come before him, but there's a man working for Sergius Paulus who is a Jew, which is, is not a racial thing. It's a religious thing. But this Jew was not a strict Jewish a practice, practicer of uh, Judaism. Uh, he was into sorcery, witchcraft. And so this, I mean, he was really messed up. And so he decides that he does not want his boss hearing the message of Jesus Christ. So he goes in there and he tries to stop. I mean, Paul and Barnabas are preaching. They are witnessing to Sergius Paulus, and here comes Elymas, that's his name. Elymas comes in, and he tries to stop them. And that's when Paul looked and rebuked with that verse that, that we looked at for a second and called him wicked and devil and so forth. And, and he prays, and Elymas is struck blind for a season. He would get his sight back, but he was blind for a while just so that he would get out of the way and stop being a distraction. And look at what it says in verse 12. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Here is an unbeliever and now a new believer who is astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. If a new believer is astonished at the doctrine of the Lord, how much more should a seasoned believer be astonished at the doctrine of the Lord? I want to tell you that if you fall in love with God's word, you will be astonished at the doctrine of the Lord the rest of your life because you never stop learning. I can sit down and read the Bible and I can sit down and read Bible scholars on any given day and come away astonished at what I've read. That's just amazing. That's just incredible. That is awesome. So that's the premise that we're going to start with tonight, that we need to hunger and thirst to be astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Now, the rest of the message I'm going to read to you. These are my words, my thoughts but there's no way that I could remember them and repeat them accurately. So I'm going to ask you to be patient and listen. It's not super long, but I want you to listen to every word, take it in, and let the Lord show you something about doctrine tonight. 
Christians should never get over being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Because the doctrine of God, Bible doctrine, Christian doctrine, is the most glorious body of truth the world has ever known. All Christian doctrine is Bible doctrine. And all Bible doctrine, in its proper context, is Christian doctrine. And what I mean by in its proper context is there are, okay, uh, there are laws in the law of Moses that do not apply to us. And we're not under the law, but there's, all, there, there's, there's uh, concepts in the law of Moses that just absolutely are, are not for Gentiles and they're not for the church. But they still make up the doctrine of the Lord if you put them in their context. Their context in that case being not that this applies to us, this passage in Leviticus, but that it's part of our faith in that this is what God gave to the Jews as they were looking for the Messiah. So that's taking it, keeping it in its context. So for that reason, I say that all Bible doctrine in its proper context is Christian doctrine. Christian doctrine tells man who God is, who man is, how God sees man, what God requires of man, and what man can expect of God. God's doctrine provides believers with a foundation for our faith. God's doctrine tells us what the Bible is, who God the Father is, who Jesus is, and who the Holy Spirit is. God's doctrine tells us who man is, what sin is, and how man can be saved from, from his sin. God's doctrine tells us what we need to know about heaven and hell, about the angels, about future events, the rapture, the tribulation, the judgment seat of Christ, the marriage of the Lamb, the second coming of Christ. These are all future events. The battle of Armageddon, the 1,000-year reign of Christ on the earth, Satan's final battle with God, the great white throne judgment, and the new heaven and the new earth. God's doctrine tells us what the body of Christ is, what the local church is, what baptism is, and how the local church should function. God's doctrine tells me who I am worshiping when I worship. To whom I am praying when I pray. Who I am obeying. How to obey him. And why I am obeying him. God's doctrine tells me with whom I am fellowshipping when I walk in the light as he is in the light. Who I am serving, why I serve him, and how to serve him. God's doctrine tells me who I am pursuing as I follow after that I may apprehend that for which I am also apprehended of Christ Jesus. That's a quotation of Philippians 3.12. God's doctrine tell, helps me to know what it is, who it is that I'm pursuing. God's doctrine instructs me to take the gospel to the lost, tells me how to lead the lost to Christ, and how to help new believers grow in their faith. God's doctrine tells me how to access everything that God has for me. God's doctrine enables me to know God. It introduces me to God's person and character. God's doctrine equips me to live every day in God's presence. These are all functions of doctrine. So we can say, oh, man, it's so boring and so tedious. But without it, you have none of these things. Without doctrine, you don't know who you're worshiping. God's doctrine provided the coats of skins for the fallen Adam and Eve. God's doctrine did this. God's doctrine provided the ark for Noah and his family. God's doctrine provided the Passover lamb for the families of Israel. God's doctrine defined Enoch's walk, Abraham's faith, 
Jacob's birthright, and Joseph's dreams. God's doctrine was the essence of the law of Moses, the message of Samuel, the songs of David, the wisdom of Solomon, and the writings of the prophets. Doctrine is not some irrelevant, distant thing. It is at the core of all these things. God's doctrine is personified in Jesus Christ. God's doctrine is the message and the mission of the New Testament church. God's doctrine is employed in the use of every piece of the armor of God. You take apart those six pieces, and number seven are marching orders, and you see at the heart of every piece of the armor that keeps us safe, you see doctrine. What's the very first one? Loins girt about with truth. What's that? That's doctrine. You will not have spiritual victory without knowing and pursuing God's doctrine. God's doctrine is the lyrics of every true psalm, hymn, and spiritual song. God's doctrine is how we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. God's doctrine will continue to be revealed in the unfolding of future events. All truth is compatible with God's doctrine. And anything that is not compatible with God's doctrine is not truth. You know, you can study the lives of many old-time scientists. The scientists upon whom all modern science is built. And the vast, major- the vast majority of them had a foundation of God's doctrine. They built what they learned. Um, One of the great scientists of the early 20th century was George Washington Carver. He had so many useful inventions that they brought him before Congress because they thought his inventions could revitalize the South. And so Congress wanted to find out what he had to offer. He had a 10-minute slot that he was supposed to fill. He wound up speaking for like 45 minutes. And the the congressmen were mesmerized. And when he finished, one of the congressmen said, Sir, how would you learn all this? George Washington Carver, in Congress, held up his Bible. Congressman said, wait a minute. You mean to tell me? And, And he was talking specifically about products that could come from peanuts. That was one of his areas of expertise. Congressman said, you mean to tell me that the Bible tells you about the peanut. George Wyden Carver said, no, sir. The Bible tells me about the God who created the peanut. And so I go into my laboratory and I get with him and he teaches me about his creation. And honestly, I know you don't want me to, I could take the next half an hour and I'm not prepared to, but I have these notes that I could share with you of scientists after scientist after scientist. Do you know, I'm going to give you one other example. Do you know who, uh, there was one man whose picture Albert Einstein had on his wall. One scientist that he respected so much that he said, that's my hero. It was a man named Michael Faraday. Michael Faraday was a born-again Christian, a Sunday school teacher, and a preacher of the gospel. He wasn't a full-time preacher like pastor, but he would fill in. His brother-in-law led a movement, actually, of, of uh, like a Christian movement. And uh, Michael Faraday helped him in his ministry work. But his science was so powerful that Albert Einstein said, that man's a genius. I'm telling you, the list is very long of men whose discoveries and inventions were built on the foundation of their knowledge of the doctrines of God. So I say again, if I can find it, I say again, all truth is compatible with God's doctrine, and anything that is not compatible with God's doctrine is not truth. To fill my life with God's doctrine is to fill my life with God. Let's try that again. With God. (laughs) With God. To fill my life with God. Listen carefully. To ignore God's doctrine is to ignore God. 
To be bored by the pursuit of God's doctrine is to be bored by God. See, we have a very feelings-driven Christianity in 2021, uh, 20, uh, two, 21st century, 2021, yeah. Um, in 21st century Christianity America, we're driven by our feelings. And if something produces good feelings, we do it. If it doesn't produce good, I'm talking about, oh, it makes me feel so good. We don't do it. Now, I'm not against feeling good, but feelings are not the driving forth force of our faith. Feelings are not how we get to know God. God's doctrine is how we get to know God. The person who thinks that Bible doctrine is tedious has taken his eyes off of the author and finisher of Bible doctrine. If I neglect the pursuit of God's doctrine, then I don't know who I'm worshiping. I don't know who I'm believing. I don't know who I'm serving. Refusing to pursue God's doctrine will lead me to worship, believe, and serve a God of my own making, which is idolatry. The pursuit of Bible doctrine is the pursuit of God. Pursuing Bible doctrine every day helps me grow, gives me understanding, purpose, and strength. God's doctrine is the most productive, fulfilling, enlightening, life-giving thing that can affect and fill the human mind and heart. I believe that with all my being. God's doctrine is the most productive, fulfilling, enlightening, life-giving thing that can affect and fill the mind, the human mind and heart. Last paragraph. I'm almost done. God's doctrine is eternal. When I love God's doctrine, I am setting my affection on things above. When I center, which is, by the way, in case you don't know, is a quote of Colossians 3. Set your affection on things above. How do you do that? One way is to love God's doctrine because God's doctrine is eternal. When I center my life around God's doctrine... I am building with gold, silver, and precious stone. When I invest in God's doctrine with time, money, talent, when I invest in God's doctrine, I'm laying up treasures in heaven. The new believer, a man named Sergius Paulus, was astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. The longer you're saved, the more astonished you ought to be at the doctrine of the Lord. And my goal over the next however long it takes, little bit at a time, is to help you more and more to be astonished, not just to know the doctrine of the Lord, but to be astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Father, help us tonight, please. Christianity has never been more shallow than it is, I believe, at this moment. And I pray that you would help us to have to hunger and thirst to know your doctrine. And God, I pray a special help from you to communicate accurately and clearly the doctrine of God so that your people will have it. Please help us, I pray, in Christ's name. Would you keep your head bowed?